Well, a very warm welcome to uh, all of you. I know we've got a, a very large group of, of attendees for this uh, fantastic uh, event that um, the APPGs for Compassionate uh, Politics, uh, which I chair, uh, and the APPG for Future Generations have put on. Many, many thanks um, to our secretariats for doing all the organisation uh, around this. For my, for people who don't know me, my name is Debbie Abrahams. I'm the MP for Old Meeston Saddleworth, uh, and as I say, also ch chair the APPG for Compassionate Politics. And we're delighted to um, it, start uh, this session off. Unfortunately, I have to leave at about quarter past uh, four. Um, but I really wanted to, to uh, say how exceptional I think our, our panel is. And of course, today, uh, the whole purpose of the event is uh, to consider how we can ensure that COP26 is effective in preventing uh, the climate breakdown that, uh, that we're all very, very concerned about. So if I could just introduce our panelists and each of the panelists is then going to uh, make a, a, a contribution. Uh, and then if you could all hold up your questions uh, until the end when then there'll be an opportunity uh, for you to um, uh, ask your question of the questions of the, of the panel. Uh, there is a chat, chat facility in um, uh, the Zoom today. If you want to ask your questions, do in the chat. We'll, we'll be monitoring for the Q&A at the end. And of course, if you could all make sure that your mics are muted uh, so that we don't get any unnecessary uh, feedback. So let me just quickly whiz through the panellists that we have for you today. Um, on the, on the panel, we have Caroline Lucas, my uh, dear friend and colleague um, from uh, MP for Brighton Pavilion and the member uh, of the Environmental Audit uh, Select Committee, but also um, chair of the APPG for Green New Deal. Tim Crossland, uh, Tim is director of Planet, uh, Plan B Earth, a charity supporting and advancing strategic legal action to contain dangerous climate change and ocean acidification. Alisa Gilbert is the Director of Policy and Translation at the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment, a world leading research and education center on climate change. Daniela Tilbury is the G uh, Gibraltar Commissioner for Future Generations, Sustainable Development and previously the Vice Chair, Chancellor, beg your pardon, of the University of Gibraltar. And she's also Chair of the UN Global Monitoring and Evaluation Expert Group in Education sustainability. And David King, who's just uh, joined us. So David King was formerly the chief scientific advisor to the government, is now the chair of the Centre for Climate Repair at, at Cambridge, and also the chair of Independent SAGE. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Elisa Gilbert. And Elisa, you've got seven minutes to make your contribution. Thank you very much, Debbie. So I've been asked to kick off our discussion today by just reminding everyone about what the latest science tells us about uh, climate breakdown. Um, and then I'm going to say a little bit about how countries are doing in terms of performing against the Paris Agreement, which was the, the, the latest large and significant climate, international climate change agreement that was made in 2015. And then talk a little bit about the negotiations that we're having in the UK later this year and what our expectations for that might be. So in terms of the latest science, uh, unfortunately, things are still not looking particularly good. Um, one of the sort of largest reports that I'd point people to who want to know more about expected climate change impacts is the special report written by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is this large group of scientists that bring together their evidence um, regularly in regular cycles. They did a special report on the impact of one and a half degrees uh, temperature increase uh, around the world a couple of years ago, and those are still extremely relevant. What that shows us is that we're still expecting significant impacts on nature um, from our expectation of climate change, including, for example, on coral reefs. And we're on track at the moment to pretty much uh, sort of destroy coral reefs, for example, completely, but also really significant impacts on people, uh, predominantly uh, the most vulnerable people at the greatest risk. So for example, even at, uh, at two degrees, we see um, sort of millions of people really will be subject to flooding, particularly coastal flooding, um, leading to probably death 
Um, so we have a number of really significant climate change impacts, and we're still unfortunately on track to those. If we look at what's happened in recent years, um, just this year, 2020, which for many of us seem to have passed perhaps in a haze where all we've spoken about is the COVID pandemic, which has been, of course, devastating. We also have seen a 2020 that has been one of the warmest years on record as well, with over 50 million people globally recorded as being affected by floods, droughts, storms, all of the impacts that we, we know are at least in part due to climate change. And we've had, for example, significant wildfires with greater intensity in places like Australia, Brazil, Russia, and the US. And some of those have had really, really great prominence in the news. Um, and so we can see that, that, that the impacts of climate change are affecting us now. And it's more and more that it's affecting us in all different parts of the world, um, as well as us having those, those uh, expectation of significant impacts in the future. Um, we are actually going to see the next um, of these big intergovernmental panels on climate change reporting in this coming year. Um, so that will be giving us an update on the science, but don't expect any of those messages to be cheery. Um, for example, some of the most recent science that has come out already this year is one that points to the impact of climate change expected on, on, uh, on nature um, that shows that it's likely that um, our, most, our most important endemic species or the native species that are most suited to specific habitats are most likely to be negative impacted by climate change. So that means that specialist species that we see at home in our various homes in the world are most likely to be negatively impacted by climate change and perhaps other species that have come and traveled from different parts of the world um, are more flexible and might thrive and so we see that there's also a horrible connection between the worst impacts of climate change and also the threats that we see posed to biodiversity. From a people perspective we also see as I said before that the greatest impacts of climate change are going to affect the most vulnerable people around the world and those least able to cope. So how are countries actually dealing um, and, and, and uh, with, with actually what they what they committed to doing in the Paris Agreement? Um, and you can look at the Paris Agreement as including three important dimensions. One is greenhouse gas emissions, um, so committing to reducing those. The second is planning for and adapting to the inevitable impacts of climate change, some of which I've just spoken about. And the third is making financial commitments, particularly the wealthiest countries in the world committed uh, to, to to releasing by 2020 100 billion dollars in uh, annual funding for the less well-off countries to tackle climate change. So how are we doing against all of those three things globally? Well, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, unfortunately, they are still going up despite these commitments. So 2019 total greenhouse gas emissions, including land use change, reached a, a new high of 59.1 gigatons. We don't want to be reporting that kind of high, nothing to be proud of. Um, and greenhouse gas emissions have grown around from 1.1 to 1.4 percent a year since 2010 on average. So, you know, we're not we're not seeming to do a very good job of actually reducing our emissions. Um, in terms of adaptation, we can see that um, that countries are getting better about really across the board, and that includes countries for whom this might be quite difficult, um, figuring out how to adapt to the impacts of climate change and beginning to plan for that. Um, however, it's going to cost quite a bit of money to do that, and those costs seem to be going up. So we still have what's referred to as an adaptation gap. So there's a really gap between what we know we need to do on adaptation and what we can do. Um, that's the same as that gap between emissions that we need to reduce um, uh, and the emissions that countries have committed to. And in terms of the finance commitments, it looks like countries might be on track to committing this 100 billion, um, but, uh, but they also need to mobilize that and this money needs to go to the right countries. So some progress is being made on things, but it's really not good enough or fast enough. So what do we want to see out of COP26? Let's talk about those three dimensions, which are really what the international negotiations will be focusing on. We need to see countries genuinely tightening up their what are called nationally determined contributions. These are their commitments to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. There was some progress made with the summit that, that Biden um, led last week, um, but that those new commitments that came from a range of countries from Canada to some added on to some existing commitments from the EU and China narrows this gap of emissions reductions that we need to see to re re reach one and a half degrees. But we still have a gap of about 20 gigatons of annual emissions. If you think about the fact that on average, the world basically emits just over 50, 55 gigatons a year. So we need to have a reduction 20 gigatons further in 2030 to actually reach one and a half degrees. So a lot of work to be done. So some tighter commitments, please, um, 
for 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 uh, COP26 from all countries, and some countries have started to make those commitments. And um, we also need policies that support those those broad strategic goals. Um, and we also need these commitments to finance to support the developing countries or those poorer countries, um, and also commitments to working on these adaptations to these impacts that we know will happen otherwise, and thinking about how we support each other, different countries, and how we learn better which types of adaptation actually work on the ground. So it's a, a reminder that we need to do uh, everything, mitigation and adaptation across all sectors, and all of us need to do that. Um, and so we're hoping that COP26 will deliver tighter commitments from countries on all of those things. And I'll stop there. Lisa, thank you so much. Uh, re really in depth in your seven minutes contribution there. So, so very grateful to you. Um, I'm going to hand over to David King now. So David King and, and over to my uh, dear colleague, uh, Philippa Whitford, who's going to take over the chair uh, after I finish now. So thank, thank you, everyone. And uh, I hope to see you at the end of uh, the session as, as I finish my uh, Backbench Business Committee uh, meeting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Debbie, uh, and uh, delighted to be here with this uh, wonderful team. Let me just very quickly say that uh, I'm a lot more pessimistic than Alyssa in the sense that the targets are really not good enough. Let me just very quickly say why I'm saying this. I don't believe we have a carbon budget to stay within 1.5 degrees to give a manageable future. Uh, if I just take you where we are today, we know that uh, ice, uh, ice has been melting over the uh, North Pole at a tremendous rate, much faster than any of the predictions that were made 10, 15 years ago. And the net result is that half of the Arctic Sea is now exposed to sunlight during the Arctic summer. And the result is that the North Pole is no longer a cold place in the middle of the uh, polar summer. It's quite a warm place. And the net result is a very big distortion in the Northern Hemisphere weather systems, but worse than that, sitting there in the Blue Arctic Sea in the summer is Greenland and Greenland's ice is now melting with a rapid feedback. And we can explain the feedback very simply as it melts the, the dust that accumulates on the surface of the ice is now accumulating because the dust exists right through the ice layers. It's accumulating at the surface and that ice is now looking quite black and it's absorbing sunlight. So this very big positive feedback means that we are at massive risk of, of flooding much faster. Of course, the Greenland ice, if it all melts, will give rise to a global sea level rise of about seven and a half meters. And that will take quite a while. Uh, we All of our predictions about how long that would take, 200, 300 years, have now got to be dished because of this rapid feedback on the, on the warming. The previous 10 years ago prediction of flood risk points out that uh, Southeast Asia is the area of the world most at risk for two reasons. One is because of rising sea levels and many of their land masses are very close to sea level. In fact, 90% of, of Vietnam is very close to sea level. Essentially, it's been pushed out by the Mekong River uh, over the last uh, many centuries, and that land mass is therefore very close to sea level. And the prediction from 10 years ago was that uh, some 50% of the land mass would be flooded perhaps once a year by mid-century, just 30 years time. The latest re-prediction by the same group tells us that will happen every year with 90% of Vietnam flooded. Vietnam is a very big source of rice. The Mekong Delta, the biggest rice paddy fields in the world, will no longer be productive once they've been salinated by the incoming sea. In the Southeast Asia region, you may have seen that Jakarta was underwater in January this year. Uh, and the prediction is that Jakarta will no longer be a livable city within less than 30 years from now. And the Indonesian government is now planning to move their capital to higher land. But of course, much of Indonesia is also very close to sea level. And that's another big rice producing area for the whole of the Southeast Asia region. Now, that's just the beginning. And I'm going to say, of course, everyone knows about Bangladesh. Uh, 
and the, the number of cities, including Calcutta, but even on the other side of India, Mumbai, that will no longer be livable, probably by mid-century, is extraordinary. We're talking about cities that have been developed over the last 30 years, no more, 25 years, the tiger economies have been growing. If anyone's been to Jakarta recently, you will know that it's a bustling modern city. And it means that that has been an investment that is no longer going to be worthy because it won't live into the future. And that future I'm talking about is very close. So I believe that where we are today with greenhouse gas levels where they are today is already too far. If we add in carbon dioxide of 415 parts per million and methane gases and use a steady state level, which we should do, we're at well over 500 parts per million. And I do not believe that we have a manageable future even at this level. So if we hit net zero tomorrow, I think we're in deep trouble. So what am I doing setting up a center for climate repair? We have major objectives. One, deep and rapid emissions reduction. Two, we need to see that we get greenhouse gas removal going at scale as quickly as possible. Our objective, working with universities around the world and working with governments, is to see that we can achieve something like and we think it's achievable, 30 to 40 billion tons of greenhouse gas removal a year. And if we did that, we might get down to 350 parts per million in the atmosphere, CO2 equivalent by the end of the century. In the meantime, we have to buy time because ice will still be lost from the Arctic unless we can do something about this. And we therefore also need to focus on how we can manage to refreeze the poles. And I'm talking about the Arctic, the Antarctic and the Himalayas. These are major objectives. And I do believe that yes, they, there will be an expense, but this is all a risk management expense for the future of mankind. So Natasha, I'm uh, sorry, Al Alyssa, Alyssa, I think we need to go much, much further. We, we certainly need to get to net zero emissions as quickly as possible. The main message there is get to uh, the least possible emissions and at the same time have greenhouse gas emissions building up as quickly as possible. I believe we've got a very short timeline to manage this to avoid perhaps 100, 200 million climate refugees before we get to mid-century this year. So it's looking rather risky in my view. And unless we spell this out with clarity, it's not going to be manageable. Now, I know that what I'm saying is not agreed by everybody in the climate science world. Um, but let me say this, if you do a risk analysis approach, and I've been working with actuaries from the city of London, you will know that you're not looking at the possibility that your house will survive and not burn down in the next few years with a 50% chance. You really also have to look at the lower probabilities. And certainly everything that I've been saying isn't in a much lower probability than 50% chance. So I'm afraid what, I, what I'm saying is we are suffering from what is a wonderful outcome in the whole world which is the rapid growth of a global middle class. The rapid growth, middle class I'm defining as people who spend between 10 and $100 a day each, just over 1 billion in the year 2000, well over 3 billion today. And that is a group of people who want to consume at the rate that we have been consuming at. Livestock is massively going up because of the rapid increase in demand for milk and meat, uh, and likewise rice production going up. And both of these are big methane producers, and methane increases in the atmosphere is a very big reason why I'm so worried. And of course, in the Arctic region, if we don't manage to refreeze it, there's the real risk of massive methane uh, explosions. There are already methane explosions in the uh, region of Yamal in the north of Russia. 
And if these explosions increase in size, there's been about a thousand of these large explosions so far, we can anticipate very much higher methane levels. So I haven't got any really good news here, except to say that in the run up to COP26, because I've been heavily involved in the negotiations, this I can talk to you as an insider. We're now in the first time, for the first time in a situation where China and the United States can potentially lead the way. We have never, I think, since the Second World War had an international agreement where the United States wasn't in the lead. Today, there's an opportunity that we have the United States and China working together and John Kerry, would not disagree with anything I've been telling you. I know John Kerry quite well. And Minister Xie Zenhua of China, who's leading the negotiations from China, would also understand these big risks. Um, if I can just say something about that. Sir, Sir David, I think we're sorry, go really gonna have my, to move on or we won't have any question time at all at the end, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but hopefully some of your uh, other comments will come out in, in the question discussion. If I could move on now to Tim Crossland, uh, who obviously everyone was introduced by Debbie earlier. So over to you, Tim. Thank you, Philippa. And thank you, everyone who's joining us at this really critical moment for, for the UK, but also for the international community. Um, I think it's healthy just to remember why we're talking about COP26. We're talking about COP26 was because we've had 25 COPs before that. That's a quarter of a century of talks. And the one really critical thing is that the trajectory of emissions has continued to rise all the way through that period. And for all the symbolic importance of the Paris Agreement in the uh, uh, six years since then, the five and a half years since then, we've seen four trillion dollars poured into the fossil fuel economy. This is knowing investment decisions from people who understood what that meant. $144 billion just from, from Barclays. So you know that that is what has been happening. And um, um, the consequence, I mean, we've had science already, but just to sum up, um, James Bevan, chief executive of the Environment Agency said this um, just this February, the reasonable worst case scenario for climate sounds like this, much higher sea levels will take out most of the world's cities, displace millions, make much of the rest of our land surface uninhabitable or unusable. Much more extreme weather will kill more people through drought, flooding, wildfires and heat waves than most wars have. The net effects will collapse ecosystems, slash crop yields, take out the infrastructure that our civilization depends on and destroy the basis of the modern economy and modern society. If that sounds like science fiction, let me tell you something you need to know. This is that over the last few years, the reasonable worst case for several of the flood incidents the Environment Agency has responded to has actually happened and it's getting larger. That is why our thinking needs to change faster than the climate and why our response needs to match the scale of the challenge. So that being the case and looking at the history of the last 25 years, one thing we might be saying to ourselves is this needs to be different. We can't just keep on doing the same thing because it's not been working. And so what we'd like to see is recognition that the world is in a state of emergency as the UN Secretary General has called on uh, parties to do. A 10 year emergency plan, taking us through to 2030 and recognizing that that plan needs to be informed by those who are suffering the impacts most immediately now and the risks in the future and making sure those people are heard. Those are the things we'd like to see, but you know, let's be realistic too. And let's look at the UK's role in this. We, it's a critical role, you know, the presidency. It sets the tone for a lot of the talks. And a key issue is trust. And it's, it's difficult when people see somebody talking about being a climate leader when they don't believe it. 
when they see someone talking about being a climate leader who's presiding over opening of a new coal mine and more and more aviation, um, um, cutting, this is a critical thing, the cutting to the, the aid budget. At this time when um, of global crisis, uh, communities on the front line so exposed, you know, this is making it really hard to make progress in the negotiations. And, and um, people should recognize that and, and take action on that here in the UK. Um, we talk about climate leadership because we've got a relatively ambitious, though completely inadequate net zero target, but relatively, it's quite an ambitious target that partly disguises the fact that for the UK, as we've naturally transitioned to a service economy, our emissions naturally come down compared to a, an economy that is um, going through a different stage of industrialization. What we don't talk about so much is the fact that 15% of global carbon emissions are funded through the city of London. And that's the most enormous amount. Um, that's really the story of the UK's contribution here. And if you imagine what that means from a young person's perspective, they're looking at the city of London financing the, the stealing of their future. And they're wondering why their parents and their grandparents are, are working in jobs that are complicit in that. It doesn't make sense. This is part of the mental health crisis we have among our young people. Why, why do we keep on doing this? And if you look at how effective some of our legislation has been around, let's say, terrorist finance, why is it legal? Why is it legal for companies, um, 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 pension funds, brokers to knowingly be investing in what we know is catastrophe? And, and we do know that. For example, we've had a disclosure from the Bank of England earlier this year that its corporate assets portfolio was tracking 3.5 degrees, a catastrophic outcome. They make that disclosure, but nothing happens. We've had Emma Lloyd Boyd, um, um, uh, chair of the Environment Agency, saying, distressingly, the FTSE 100 index is guiding us towards four degrees warming. But distressingly makes it sound as though this is some sort of force majeure, something out of our control. But no, these are decisions that we are making. We're investing in four degrees through the city of London, through companies within the jurisdiction of the UK. So this brings me to the bit that I'm meant to be talking about, um, the laws, the legal framework. I'm not sure the answer is um, making nationally determined contributions legally enforceable. That's the key part of, or a key element of, of um, the Paris Agreement, because people are choosing their own targets. So what does it really mean to make those you know, more legally enforceable and who's going to sue them? What we want to see is governments actually Im implementing the commitments of the Paris Agreement, international law. Um, um, we'd like to see a legal and administrative framework to, to, to ensure that finance flows, both public and private, are working towards the Paris temperature limit and guiding us there. That just isn't present at the moment. That's really what we want to see. We, we are about to launch a new legal action against the government. It's a human rights-based claim. We're uh, bringing it in conjunction with three young people who say, well, this is my right to life. This is my right to family life. You know that the Paris temperature limit is key to my future, but you're not doing what's needed. And that is a breach of um, your fundamental obligations to your people. So that's, that's what we want to see. We want to see strong action in the UK because that then makes it easier for us to influence others. We're not seeing that at the moment. We need to be honest. Um, um, and finally, what we'd like uh, to see is more emphasis on this key principle, the polluter pays principle. That's not just a principle of justice that makes sure that those who are profiting from pollution actually have to foot the bill. It's also a really sound economic principle, because without that, you have a complete market failure. <laughs> um, um, the costs are born in the wrong place. 
Um, and even Rishi Sunak acknowledges that in his um, um, the Treasury's net zero report. That is a key problem, the externalities. Um, so yes, more of the polluter pays principle. And let's not imagine that it's all going to be solved at COP26 because it isn't. Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, if we could come on now to Professor Daniela Tilbury. I'm just unmuting myself. Hello, good afternoon. Um, an absolute pleasure to be with you today. And uh, so much has already been said by the panel about our future outlook. And I want to start by saying that I agree with the bleak news and I have come to terms with that bleak news. It's what drives us to actually be more ambitious, to, to make a change. But I also think there's another perspective here that's really important uh, that we do need to talk about and that does need to be present in COP26. And that is what else we do other than just push for targets and other than just push for legislation. And I think this is where a role such as mine, I'm the Commissioner for Sustainable Development of Future Generations in Gibraltar, is really quite critical because we, yes, we do need to make our governments accountable. Yes, we do need to push these agendas, but we also need to understand that we have to create a social context and a social engagement so that these targets are actually being implemented so that the people are supportive, so that people are engaged. And that's a little bit of what I want to talk about today. First, I want to say that, yes, we are talking about climate change, but actually, the talk today is very much about climate breakdown. And we have been told we have five years until climate breakdown. More precisely, we have one five chance that the annual global temperatures will be at least 1.5 degree warmer already in the next five years. So the scenario Sir David is talking about, the reminder that Alicia and Tim have, have mentioned in terms of the evidence in front of us, I fully embrace. And in fact, I live in Gibraltar, and I'm not sure how many of our audience have actually visited Gibraltar, but we're a peninsula. We are surrounded by water. There is no escaping climate change here. Climate change is our daily reality. And the IPCC report suggests that along with the rest of the Southwest Europe, the rock will suffer from increased risk of flooding due to sea level rise, hotter summers and wetter winters. The truth is that today, a spring day that is usually uh, full of sunshine, it's a very wet day and we're experiencing a spring that has had very heavy rainfall. Climate change is here for us already. So what is it we need to do? What do we expect, expect from COP26? Yes, more legislation, more policy instruments, more ambitious targets, but also other measures. We need to be more creative in key priority areas. Adaptation and resilience is key. But are we truly aware of what the current and future risks are? Does the everyday person really understand this? Once we embrace that in legislation, once we commit to those targets, if we do, whatever they are, whether they be ambitious or not ambitious, there's still the element of implementation that requires us bringing people with us to implement these targets. But the truth is that, you know, in Gibraltar, for example, we have gazetted the Climate Change Act. We've got 80% targets on reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. We've got very ambitious plans, um, you know, national mitigation adaptation plans. But the truth is, Climate change, climate realities are not in our conversations of the economy. They're not in our conversations when we talk about health and the pandemic. They're not in our conversations when we talk about education, competencies, learning. They are still very much perceived as the responsibility of the Department of Environment and Climate Change. They're not in our tourism strategies. They're not in our bunkering strategies. We have to mainstream this agenda. We need to talk about the science, we need to talk about the ethics, and maybe, maybe the intergenerational justice perspectives that we need, that, that are suddenly um, gaining ground, may be an inroad, a way into bringing this to the forefront of our conversations. 
And please don't don't um, interpret this as me trying to divert away from the climate science or away from the factual realities that embrace us. But it is so important that we bring in long term perspectives as well as the immediate um, risks that are confronting us. And as guardian for the future generations, which is the role of my office, we are looking for bringing these into daily conversations. We are looking at that joined up planning across government departments that creates that culture of responsibility, accountability, and challenging business as usual. That's what we're trying to do. But there's a, you know, if we do not engage with this level of conversations, the result is what we're seeing perhaps here and beyond the rock, which is that people who are committed to climate change are focusing on energy efficiency at home, energy efficiency in government offices, lighting, agendas that are important, but perhaps missing the much bigger picture. It's more than recycling, it's more than being a vegan, it's more than energy efficiency, it's much more than reducing carbon footprints. We need to engage stakeholders in creating that far more strident vision of an alternative future that is in which carbon does not play a role. We don't know what that looks like. So we keep talking and talking and talking about having to decarbonize, about having to have a different type of world, but actually in the COP26 discussions and in the priorities that are facing us, there is nowhere, there's no space for the stakeholder engagement, for the creating of alternative visions that are realistic and that tell us what it looks like and therefore what, how we can progress to those alternative perspectives. We do have innovation and we do have elements of entrepreneurs presenting new technologies, but we need greater conversations that provide some depth, that provide some engagement, some positivity that can engage and motivate people to move to this more um, significant future that can actually not only be better for the environment, but actually better for our health, better for our economy. Can we visualize this? Can we detail this? Can we have those conversations in the road to COP26? And just to finish off to say, yes, I would love our governments to really wrap up the outstanding items so that we can fully implement the Paris Agreement. Yes, we would really like those promises to be kept so that developing countries can actually access those $100 billion that is necessary for um, mitigation and adaptation in those more vulnerable countries. And we need to raise our climate ambition, but please, can we have some space for detailing, outlining, engaging people in creating these alternative visions of the future where carbon has no place? We need those frameworks for understanding intergenerational um, impacts of climate change. We need those frameworks and incentives to create these alternative visions. And, and I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, uh, Daniela. Obviously, we need to focus more on not just our grandchildren, but the grandchildren of our grandchildren and try to be better ancestors. Uh, finally, in our speaker panel, I'm delighted to invite my colleague, Caroline Lucas, uh, who I work with in several uh, fora to speak for her seven minutes. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks so much, Philippa. And I just want to say how important I think this debate is because the question could not be more urgent as we've been hearing from all of the contributions this afternoon, every warning light on the dashboard is flashing red. And so my brief remarks, I just wanted to set out three tests of what I think the UK's climate leadership needs to look like in the coming months. And it requires government to act with the speed and the scale that the science demands, turning targets on a page into real action delivered on the ground. And one bit, one bit of good news might just be that the terrible experience of living through COVID has demonstrated that when they choose, when there is a common understanding about the urgency of the threat, ministers can act fast. They can do things that we would never have expected. They wrote off 13 billion pounds of NHS debt almost overnight. They housed the homeless. They supported millions who couldn't work. And for a while at least, however imperfectly, they put health and well-being above short-term profit and growth. They found the so-called magic money tree. 
Now that's the kind of ambition and urgency that we need to tackle the nature and climate emergencies. And what's different is that now it has shown to be possible. So for those three tests, the first is about climate coherence, by which I mean all policies have to be aligned around the same objective, creating a world in which everyone can thrive within the means of our one life-giving planet. It means not allowing progress in one area, getting coal off the electricity grid, for example, to be completely undermined by policies in another, like the famous new coal mine in 30 years in Cumbria, for example, or the pursuit of a 27 billion pound road building scheme or the inexplicable scrapping of the Green Homes Grant or the refusal to rule out issuing new North Sea oil and gas licenses or the setting up of a new infrastructure bank, that's definitely good, but refusing to rule out lending projects to, to, to projects driving fossil fuel extraction, that is very definitely bad. And that list goes on. These are not the actions of a government committed to climate leadership. Climate coherence also means recognizing that climate and nature are two sides of the same coin. And so the strategy for COP26 has to be aligned with and informed by the strategy for COP15, the Biodiversity Summit in Kunming in October. But more than anything else, climate coherence has to mean recognizing that we cannot continue with an economic system based on ever increasing growth if we are to protect and to restore our climate and the natural world. A new UN climate science report recently warned, and I quote, that economic stimulus focused primarily on growth would jeopardize the Paris Agreement. Well, that's putting it pretty mildly. And the government, as presidents of both G7 and COP26, should be leading the world in redesigning the economy to put the well-being of people and planet first. And then my second test, climate realism. And by that I mean that we need to commit to action that is commensurate with the scale of the emergency that we face. As others have said, net zero by 2050 is simply nowhere near ambitious enough. Greta Thunberg famously says, act as if your house is on fire because it is. Well, when your house is on fire, you don't dial 999 and ask for the fire engines to come in 30 years time, you want them now. And we also need to face the truth that even if all of the ambitions that we have for COP26 were met, it still wouldn't be enough. And Alicia has already pointed to the so-called emissions gap between what we need and what's being committed. And when we're looking at the UK's efforts, they're talking a good talk, but they're not delivering yet. Yes, we had that announcement last week that they would accept the Climate Change Committee's advice on the sixth carbon budget, the 78% reduction emissions by 2035. But as it stands, the UK is not on track to achieve either the fourth or the fifth carbon budgets, which are based on much weaker commitments of an 80% reduction by 2050. And it doesn't include the fact that 46% of the UK's total carbon footprint comes from imported emissions to feed our domestic consumption. And it's worth bearing in mind too that the government's much trumpeted 10 point plan launched last autumn takes us only about halfway towards the inadequate emission cuts that we have from the government's own targets. So we need to tell the truth about our climate emissions and rich nations in particular need to do the maths. The IPCC has estimated that a global carbon budget, the total burnable carbon between 2018 and 2100, consistent with a 66% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees warming is just 420 billion tons of CO2. That is currently being burned at approximately 40 billion tons per year. On current trends, that gives us just 10 years until 2030 at the latest before that global carbon budget is used up. And after that point, we would have to rely on costly and uncertain negative emission technologies to avoid global heating of more than 1.5 degrees. So that is the reality. That is the inconvenient truth that we have to face. And my final test is to ensure that climate justice is at the heart of the COP26 process. This is a crisis overwhelmingly created by the wealthiest in society. Almost 50% of global emissions are produced by the richest 10% of the world's population. But the impact of those emissions are hurting the poorest first and worst. Justice demands that the voices of the climate vulnerable countries and communities are heard loud and clear at COP26, not left out on the sidelines. Justice demands that addressing loss and damage is a priority, that new and additional climate finance is provided over and above the $100 billion committed in Paris, but still not fulfilled. 
And justice also demands that the concerns of young people are met. Young people have been at the forefront of fighting for change and it is their futures at stake. We owe it to them to ensure that their voices are heard at COP26 and more fundamentally that the well-being of future generations is at the heart of policy development. That's why I introduced a bill into the House of Commons last year, which would require public bodies to consider the well-being of future generations. Because as we come out of this awful pandemic, there has to be a change in thinking. There can be no return to normal because normal was nowhere near good enough. There could be no longer prioritizing short-term economic goals above the health of people and planet. Thanks very much, Caroline. That was very powerful. Um, I'm pleased that a, a motion I had put forward up here for the Scottish Government uh, for a Wellbeing and Sustainability Act is going to be taken forward exactly around um, the, the future generations, but it needs to be radical. As a medic, I feel very disappointed that we haven't had a global response to the global crisis of COVID. And if we don't learn from the shambles we have at the moment of wealthy countries being able to vaccinate themselves and poorer countries being completely left out, we're going to just make as much of a hash of, of the climate response as well. Now, Debbie has returned. Um, so I'm going to hand the chair back to her. Unfortunately, we only have quite a short time uh, for questions, but back to you, Debbie. Thanks so much, Philip. I really appreciate that. And I'm sorry that I missed uh, some, I'm sure, excellent uh, contributions. Um, do we have any questions that have been forwarded to us? I can't see any. They're, they're in the Q&A. They're in the Q&A, Debbie. Okay. Down at so, the bottom of your screen. Yeah, I've, I've clicked onto that. I can't see any specifically. Oh, maybe so, because uh, you weren't there. Okay, <laughs> then I'll, I'll have a look at that. Um, uh, hey, um, there's one um, which I would suggest is for Sir David King. If we can try and have short answers and others only a uh, signal to come in if you've really something to say, but someone is asking how you refreeze the poles and the Himalayas and having watched the science fiction film Snowpiercer, um, you know, I wouldn't like to see us do that and get it badly wrong either. So over <laughs> to you, Sir David. Well, there's, there's a group at Stanford University, uh, quite a big group that is working up there in the Arctic region and uh, what they're doing, I'm not saying that this is going to work, is, is putting small silica uh, bubbles, sil uh, like glass spheres, over the ice during, uh, at the end of the winter period, so that during the summer period, the sun would be reflected away instead of being absorbed by the ice and, and, and heating it up. What we're doing is working on something called marine cloud brightening, and we're doing this work with the University of Edinburgh and, uh, and with a group in, in the Netherlands, the Netherlands being a place that's a little bit concerned about rising sea levels. <laughs> and, and so we, uh, what we're looking at is creating white cloud cover over the Arctic Sea during the Arctic summer. It's only a two or three month summer, and we would only do this during that summer period so that the previous year of ice cover is retained and then every year we can grow another layer. We would have to keep this going perhaps for 30 years. So is that like the experiments that Sweden did with putting some form of, uh, or are doing uh, 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 some no. form of chalk particles into the air on that sounds the same kind of thing. The idea was- No, it is, no it is nothing like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that what they were talking about is putting uh, the, this chalk dust up into the stratosphere to reflect sunlight away. But of course, once you've got it up in the stratosphere, it may not just reflect sunlight away from the polar regions. It may reflect it away from uh, the, the planet more generally. This is something that I would say we should have a moratorium against running at scale. I'm all for experiments, but I don't think that we want to really risk, for example, losing the, uh, the very heavy rainfalls that India depends on. The climate system of the world would possibly change in ways we cannot yet predict. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, we have a question which is asking about the fact that the, the UK government's Climate Change Act only calls for them to limit emissions, 
and not sufficiently reducing them. Um, so do the panelists believe that we can actually use the Paris Agreement to get the governments to drive uh, emissions down, that we actually go backwards, not just net zero? I don't know, Caroline, do you want to come in on that? Do you think we could get the, the buy-in to really enact here in the UK, the Paris, uh, the legally binding, make legally binding the Paris targets? Well, I, I'm surprised by the government's argument about the Climate Change Act, because that's not really how I understand it, at least. Um, no, it's not. Uh, I, I don't think if that's what they were saying, that that's correct. Um, the question about whether or not we could find a way to to make Paris legally binding. I think in a way, Tim touched on that by saying that the trouble with Paris in the sense is that the, the um, nationally determined contributions, the NDCs are, are, are ones that the countries come up with themselves. They're not what's scientifically necessary. They're what's politically expedient by the government of whatever country at whatever time. If I could just give a quick shout out a bit, um, a, a bit cheekily to my climate and ecological emergency bill uh, which is a private member's bill, which now has the support of around 120 MPs on a cross-party basis, uh, which I think would be what we need, which is absolutely about doing what the science demands um, and uh, making sure that the, the goal absolutely is to keep below 1.5 degrees rather than coming up with each different country's NDC. I think that would be a better way forward to make something legally binding because I think Paris, that it was not designed that way. And so I think it'd be quite hard to retrofit that onto it. Uh, we have a question from Natalie Schenker, and it's talking about getting cross-government approach, both from the point of view of climate change, public health, and well-being, as you talked about, uh, Caroline. Debbie and I are also part of the health in all policies. Um, so the idea of getting government to take well-being, people's you know, environmental, physical, mental well-being into policy is a, an ongoing battle. So I don't know whether any of our panelists uh, would like to talk about um, Daniela about trying to get cross government approach. Yes, if I may, because that's part of my remit here in Gibraltar, and I've had a little bit of experience of working internationally in this area as well. I think I think this is this is a, a very important aspiration, but the difficulty of this uh, is is also quite significant. What I'd like to do is actually tackle the last part of this question, if I may, Philippa because um, Natalie is talking about all government policies having a carbon assessment, uh, whichever departments there are. Um, I would say this is important, but not enough. In fact, what we need is a mind shift change in these government departments, not just in terms of working together, but actually not just doing an assessment to minimize carbon footprints, but actually to aim towards zero carbon first above everything else. And that requires re-envisioning the work that they're doing and how they're doing it, how they're procuring, how they're working. It challenges uh, a lot of the government business at, at a core as against to saying, this is our current carbon assessment and we are progressively reducing our impact over the next five years. I think it's too late for that. That's my view. I think we need to, push that view aside and rethink from the start, how do we do things very differently? Not just to reduce, but to reconsider the impact. And you, you talked earlier about trying to engage the public, but I mean, my impression as a, as a medic, as well as an MP is that the, there is actually a hunger among the public not to go back to business as usual, but to go forward. I mean, in public meetings, I've done you know we've talked about 2030 and the need for change but modifying a speeding train is really challenging well actually our society and economy has been brought to a shuddering halt by covid and therefore there is actually the opportunity to decide what is it we build back it's going to cost money time energy so let's not rebuild back to the economy we had and then modify it let's actually go forward to to that different shape. And I, I don't know about others in the panel, but certainly my perception being, you know, speaking to constituents is people are hungry for a different way of life after COVID. They have, they've changed their, um, you know, their priorities. Yeah, timing is good, as you say, Philippa, timing is good for this. Um, there's a technical question. Uh, maybe one of the organizers could answer it. 
from Michael Stock just asking whether the Conservative Environment Network uh, were invited. So maybe if one of our organisers could type the reply to that. Um, we have a question from Fergal McEntee um, just asking how we break the grip of fossil fuels because we're still only really at about 15% renewable energy uh, globally. So, you know, in, in Scotland, there's a lot of talk about hydrogen. We're very well set up to, to do that. That's beginning. How do we accelerate these things? We have a lot of, we, we almost made our 100% renewable electricity last year. We were at over 97%. But, you know, how do we get that moving quicker? I don't know who would want to, Tim or Al Alyssa, whether you would want to comment on how we get that accelerated on a global scale. Tim, just, yeah, in you come. Yeah, just one quick point, I and mean, this is part of it, this is part of getting the politics right, and this links in to some of the allegations flying around at the moment about the relationship between government and the private sector and SLEAS. And of course, part of the problem, and it's been there for decades, is the immense power of fossil fuel corporations and their links to the media, the power of the Murdoch press, Rupert Murdoch, who sits on the board of Genie Oil and Gas, along with Dick Cheney, and the power he's had over British politics, and the ability just to shape the, the conversation. I mean, just going back to the Australian wildfires, how the Murdoch press was able to sow disinformation around that, that is much more powerful on the minds of ordinary people than you know we might sometimes like to think. You only have to look at the comments under um, um, an article on the BBC to see that. So part of it is getting that right and um, um, somehow reclaiming our democracy. Now, we, we're, we're kind of running out of time, but the last question in the Q&A, I think, is quite poignant in that this uh, meeting was called, how do we make COP26 actually work? What are the things? So we're going to run over a little bit of time, but in the order people spoke, starting with Alyssa, kind of ri literally have one thing uh, not repeating what someone else said, that you think is critical to making sure the right people are at COP, the right people are heard, and we actually get something that people enact. You first, Alyssa. Okay, so I think it's, it's it, you, I mean, I think you touched upon it there. This is a global problem. So what COP26 brings, it, it's not delivering emissions reductions, but it brings everyone in the globe together and, and pushes forward this common sense of responsibility um, and makes us sort of get the sense of ambition as high as it can possibly be, a sense of urgency and a sense of ambition for all of those countries, including this kind of sense of support as well. I mentioned that in the sort of climate finance part of the story. So I think it's this important bringing together of these different countries around the world and pushing ourselves to the highest common denominator of action, not the lowest common denominator. Okay, so really important in the presence of COVID that poorer countries, which are the ones going to be most affected, are not somehow left out, either because they can't travel or because they don't have vaccines. Uh, Sir David King, uh, one sentence, what you would say we need to do to make COP26 work? So I'm speaking as somebody who was uh, taking the negotiations forward on the British part, and I've worked with four prime ministers. Uh, so the first thing is, Every bit of work has to be done in advance. The COP meeting itself is not where decisions are made. The decisions are made separately. And I spent, in the run up to COP21, I, I visited 96 countries on official visits and we negotiated. This was bilateral negotiation. And that really has to be done and it has to be done with ambition. Uh, so I, I don't think we can just sit back and wait. Now, the second thing, and I know you only wanted one, but the second thing which fits in with that is we can make a coalition of willing countries that will take significant action much more quickly. The 25 countries that belong to Mission Innovation, which is something I began, now spending nearly $30 billion a year on the alternative energy systems we need, was formed just by inviting countries to join. Those 25 countries, including China and India and the United States and Europe, are the countries that contribute 80% of the global GDP. If we can just get a coalition of the willing going, 
then I think the rest will fall in. Thanks very much. Over to you, Tim. So one thing is recognising that these talks are hugely important to the UK. We've got this chairing role at this critical moment. It's hugely important to our relationship with the, the US, with China, with India, with all the other parties there, to go into it at this moment, having cut the aid budget and cutting the financial lifeline from all those communities on the front line. This isn't about um, um, aid. This is a massive act of self-harm. Yeah, well. So for parliamentarians to come across the House now, at this moment, and say, let's get this right, let's give ourselves a chance, this is in the UK's interests, let's reverse that catastrophic decision, that is the one thing that we should do now. I, I would totally agree with that. I think we've been writing letters left, right and centre trying to get change. Daniela, to you. I support what's been said so far, but also want to stress that we can make COP26 more effective by not focusing on COP26 event as an event and actually taking the decisions and the dialogues outside of that forum into the G7, into all the major political platforms, into the citizenship engagement platforms that exist. Take it out, mainstream it. Don't just focus it on two weeks and key decision makers that are doing negotiations around that specific event. Otherwise we'll fail. Thank you. And finally to Caroline Lucas. <laughs> it's hard to add on to that, but just to build on what Daniela was saying, yes, the G7, the G20, COP15, the Biodiversity One, COP26 and beyond, there needs to be an ongoing strategy. But if I would just want, underline one thing, I do think that, again, building on what Tim said about finance, the other side of that is loss and damage. That is such an important thing for the climate vulnerable countries that if we don't deliver something on that, then I think they will understandably feel extremely angry and betrayed. And the other thing is, yes, it's wonderful to have more renewable energy coming on stream, but that doesn't make a difference unless you're also reducing the fossil fuel uh, ex extraction at the same time. So if I could just put down a, a marker to say that I think that we need the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is a new idea that's being developed right now, which will be a multinational way of agreeing to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Thanks very much. And as I touched on earlier, I think practically it is really important that those countries that uh, are suffering from climate change the most are the ones most likely to be excluded from the event, uh, whether physically or virtually. And I think that making sure their voices are there, not through someone else, but directly themselves, I think is really important. And that comes back to Tim's comment about AIDS, access to vaccines, access to travel, everything else. So I think all of us have to stand up for that. So sorry that we've run on uh, a few minutes extra. I think we could easily have had another hour of uh, Q&A, but my thanks to all the speakers and to the two APPGs uh, for organizing this, to Natasha and Matt who did all the heavy lifting. Thank you.